Well, let me thank you very much for your very kind introduction, and I had no idea of the um, personal touch that was added at the end, and I'm very pleased, if that's the case, if um, any of this research could be helpful to you and could, uh, of course, encourage the development of cognitive linguistics that we see today in the world, and in particular in China, in many, many different cities and many, many different universities. So I have been fortunate, indeed, uh, to be able to interact with people in several Beijing universities now, and uh, this afternoon, very fortunate and honored to be able to speak in your university. Um, the topic... <coughs> The topic this afternoon is material culture and meaning construction. And let me try to explain in very quickly how material culture can be a topic of um, importance for linguists and a topic of interest in order to actually perhaps discover some principles that operate outside of language but are equally fundamental for language itself. Now, why, um, why do this? Because cognitive linguistics is probably very different from a number of standard linguistic approaches and frameworks in trying to look at the cognitive basis for thinking and for language. And that cognitive basis, as it turns out, shares a lot with other human activities, human activities other than speech and language. And so this is why there is th this interesting intersection in the work we do between work in linguistics and work in other areas of cognitive science. Uh, very quickly, for those of you, I've, I've been doing this now in every one of the lectures outside of Beihang, for those of you who join us uh, only for this lecture or only today because uh, you were not at the, at the previous ones, I just wanted to briefly recapitulate. There are websites here where you can find a lot of the readings, a lot of the materials that I uh, talk about. Uh, there are quite a number of books now in, that are on conceptual blending, which is, the, again, the... Uh, organizing framework for the lectures that I've been giving. But these books are on a variety of topics that are quite different. Some are linguistics, but others are um, design, artificial intelligence, art, music, literature, and so on. So this is, if you like, a sort of display of the evidence for the mutual, mutually beneficial interaction between various areas of cognitive science looking for similar principles of human thought and action. Um, in every one of these lectures, I have, again, pointed to what is the sort of background philosophical spirit of the work that we do. And in particular, that language is only the tip of the iceberg of meaning construction. So when we speak or when we uh, sign, if we're using sign language, there is enormous mental activity that's going on that we're not conscious of, but that is crucial to understanding how language works, but also how human thinking works. Uh, meaning construction operates in many areas of human activities, and number three, the conceptual mappings that we study are the same, actually, in these superficially different-looking areas. So, again, the, the fundamental point of our spirit of inquiry is that linguistics can therefore shed light on other areas by revealing, because language is so rich and so interesting to study in the ways that it guides meaning and prompts for meaning, uh, linguistics can help uh, in many ways to shed light on general human thinking. But conversely, and this is a little bit the focus of the lecture this afternoon, conversely, 
it turns out that the study of meaning construction in other areas can in turn lead to insights in linguistics proper. So let me move on. Um, this is the same sort of thing in a single sentence, the same general philosophy of research, what happens in our heads. And the, um, organi the sort of main organizing concepts here have been the notion of conceptual integration with this, mi this is a minimal schema where you only have two inputs. In reality, in any real human phenomenon, you have m many more usually than two inputs and many inputs that are psychologically, can, that can be psychologically different for the same people, the people um, um, experiencing the same overt stimulus, if you like, will typically trigger different inputs depending on their experience and so on, but there will be, of course, a common core which allows for us to exchange meaning and ideas without uh, total misunderstanding, but with some misunderstanding, usually. The, the principles are, the, the, the main, the fundamental principles are to take the inputs and be able to match them and find partial counterpart connections, uh, to find generic structure that they share and that will motivate these mappings, and then to create new blended spaces by projecting selectively from the inputs and <coughs> creating emergent structure in a blended, in novel blended spaces and also all over the network. So in the previous lectures, we actually studied quite a number of examples, like this example of the boat race. I won't, uh, I'll just, I just point to it so that you can um, look at it, if you like, directly in the, in the readings. Uh, also examples of grammar. In lecture number six, we um, noted and studied the, the important fact that grammatical constructions typically involve double scope conceptual blending. Now double scope blending is the kind of blending where the inputs are different and have different organizing frames. And this morning in the lecture at Beijing Normal University, um, I actually talked about the origins of language and specific human thought and developed an argument which is published and again can be read by those who uh, were not at this lecture, but the argument was that um, there was gradual biological, neurobiological evolution in this case that led to uh, different types of blending capacities, some of which are attested in primates and other mammals for that matter, and others which seem to have developed gradually and be specific to humans, in particular the all-important double-scope blending which makes certain singular human activities like religion, art, science, technology, and language that make them possible. So uh, the gist of the argument in this morning's lecture was that it was because blending evolved gradually, there were presumably very, very slow biological mutations, but the species that we belong to are anatomically and cognitively modern humans that probably originated in Africa about 50,000 years ago. And this is the, the, uh, uh, the thesis of geneticists and archaeologists. And so 50,000 years ago, you would suddenly have uh, the humans who are not just anatomically like us, but cognitively like us, and that would account for the sudden explosion of human activities like cave, beautiful cave paintings, you know, prehistoric cave paintings about 35,000 years ago, or very diverse tools suddenly, whereas before the tools were reproduced, always the same and very simple. Um, or, presumably, language. So language would, would also come along at that point. This is why from that point of view, double scope um, uh, 
capacity, the capacity for double scope blending two inputs of very different kinds, is, seems to be fundamental to many of the specific human kinds of activities. And so, in the, in the domain of grammar, um, the double scope blending of grammatical constructions explains a number of uh, interesting linguistic facts, like in this case, the facts in English linked to the caused motion construction. Again, I refer you to the corresponding readings if you did not, if you could not hear the lecture on Sunday. Also, um, an, an interesting note was that syntactic complexity has nothing to do with meaning complexity. So, very simple grammatical constructions, like in this case, adjective noun, guilty pleasures, we are able, in order to interpret them, to decompress a very long causal relationship. The fact that, for example, if, we, if I smoke, uh, it's a guilty pleasure. Well, smoking triggers pleasure, which in turn causes guilt. So there's a long causal chain here, but there is nothing that is a thing that's a pleasure and that thing would feel guilty, okay? That's not what these kinds of constructions give you. So the importance of causal compressions is something that we have stressed in the whole series of lectures many, many times from many different angles. Again, here are some examples that were given on Sunday of uh, very simple grammatical constructions, dolphin safe, tuna, child safe beach, shark safe beach. And the point was that in order to reconstruct the meaning, you had to use, of course, complex background knowledge, but you also had to do a very intricate causal decompression. The dolphin safe tuna being, for example, tuna that has been fished in such a way that the tuna were caught and the tuna were killed and the tuna are now in the can and ready for you to eat, but the dolphins were not harmed in the process of the, fi of the uh, fishing. And all that gets compressed into dolphin safe tuna. Child safe beach is a beach that is good for children because there are no dangers. But shark safe beach is also a beach that's good for children and adults because there are no sharks. So even though the structure is the same, the causal decompression is different and one can uh, systematically account for this in terms of decompression and compression. Uh, metaphor is again a topic that we spent a fair amount of time on and one of the things that was important to, to note was that in order to get metaphor, you had to be able to do, again, double scope conceptual blending. Why? I've used this example many times now in the lectures, but I'm uh, reviving it once more for the people who uh, are just joining us. And so the point that was made was that in the appar apparent source domain of digging your own grave, it's the source domain of digging graves. And in that domain, there are two people, the digger and the dead person, and there's a causal and chain of events that goes from the death of the person to the digging by the other person. It's because one dies that the other does the digging. But in the target domain of the metaphor, you have one person, the actor, who is making the mistakes, and the mistakes are causing the failure, which happens later. So even though digging corresponds to making mistakes and the actor corresponds both to the digger and ultimately to the dead person, you can see that the source and target do not match in structure. So you cannot use the uh, standard simple source to target transfer of inferences because it would give you the wrong result. Uh, what happens here, as in many, if not most, metaphors, is that you have a conceptual blend in which one of the inputs transfers some of the frame structure, the frame compression, there's a digger and there is death, and it's a very human scale, what we've called human scale events that we can understand easily. But the structure, the frame structure, the fact that there is only one actor and the causal 
and event structure is transferred from the other inputs. So in the blended space, we get a special kind of death that is the result of digging your own grave and when it's big enough, you fall in the grave and you die. And of course, that in turn is <coughs> in the blended space making the mistakes and failing in, for example, in your financial enterprises. The, 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 the result needed for today's lecture is again that we need the double scope blending and that the second important result is that we are able to compress things by blending. So the complicated idea of making mistakes, not being aware of them, and uh, maybe failing later financially because you've made more and more and more mistakes, this is all compressed into a very direct human scale uh, scenario of you dig the grave and it's deep and suddenly you're in the hole and you can't get out and you die. Um, the, the, the compressions that we can have are either outer space compressions, relations that link, hmm, I don't know what's on here, I don't know if there's anything on here, uh, the relations that link things in the two inputs can be compressed into a single relation in the blended space, and I will come back to examples of that, or the compression can be borrowed from one of the inputs and projected to the blended space. So, let's see if we have any, any examples of that. Here's projection of an inner space relation to the blended space. Well, the case of grammar, for example, borrowing a simple syntactic construction like uh, throw the ball into the yard and blending it with a complex causal structure such as uh, sneezing, Gogol sneezes and as an effect of the sneezing there's some air and the air happens to blow into a napkin and the napkin falls off the table and all that gets compressed into Gogol sneeze the napkin off the table, a very simple syntactic structure. So, the so grammatical constructions in that sense are compressions that can apply to much more uh, diffuse and intricate meaning situations. And I use over and over again, so apologies to those who followed me from <laughs> university to university, but I used again and again this excellent example of the politician who vetoes a foreign aid bill that would have given money that could have been used to buy food, that could have been transported on boats, that could have been taken to poor countries in which there are children who uh, uh, don't have enough food and some of those children are, are starving and if the bill had been voted then you know the long chain of events might have given some food to the poor children. Um, and the compression here consists in taking the politician who vetoed the bill who said, you know, who prevented the bill from being voted and saying to that politician, uh, you are snatching the food out of the mouth of starving children or pointing to the politician and saying, uh, he's a really horrible person, he's snatching food from the mouth of starving children. Again, this is a case of borrowed compression because we take the already compressed and human scale scenario of somebody taking ch food from children and we blend it with this much more complex chain of events that have many political actors and many of course customs officers involved and, and dockers and people transporting food and on and on and on and the compression is perfectly sensible for everybody. We understand that even though, of course, it is literally false. So these are important um, examples of compression and in doing compression in these conceptual blends, there are some overarching goals which is to end up in the blended space with something that is diffuse, becoming compressed and simple obtaining global insight because directly you see a scene that you understand. Somebody who takes food from children, you understand. Whereas a long chain of political events is 
hard to uh, uh, conceive. The sort of overriding principle that contains all the others is that you achieve human scale in the blended, in the blended space. You are now, for example, with the snatching the food or digging the grave, you have scenes and scenarios that are directly intelligible to people because they've experienced them, they have a spatial component, they happen in a short time, and they have few actors, two, three, or three maximal, maximum actors. Uh, they also have stronger emotions in them, stronger vital relations uh, in the blended space of the pe person snatching food. You are angry at that person you have emotions for what he's doing to the, to the poor children. Those emotions are projected from one of the inputs and they now apply to the other input because by virtue of the uh, emergent, emergent structure in the blended space. Okay, so these are just examples um, of um, compression and compression is a very general phenomenon you can find in the book that was cited in the, intro, in the kind introduction here, uh, you can find in chapter 16 of that book, The Way We Think, you can find a detailed analysis of the constraints on blending and compression and how, um, for example, analogy can compress into identity which itself can compress into uniqueness and uh, on and on. There are many. Time can compress into space, but it can also compress into shorter amounts of time. Cause effect, cause, causal relations compress into uniqueness very easily. Okay, so this was a, a quick background about what we've been doing, and now I'm, I'm going to get into the actual topic of today's lecture. And the topic is triggered by some extremely interesting work by a colleague of mine who's a cognitive scientist and anthropologist. His name is Ed Hutchins. And he discovered and proved and showed that when you build these conceptual blends, there are ways to anchor them to material objects and that cultures actually develop specific material objects that will anchor the blends and the material objects will then be transmitted to further generations which will allow the transfer of the blends themselves. How is that different from what I just talked about? The examples I talked about, the examples with uh, you know, compression of an idea or compression of a metaphor, or compression of a grammatical construction, those examples had inputs that were completely mental. They're in our heads. We have, on the one hand, the idea of the person snatching food. On the other hand, the idea of the politician vetoing the bill. But now, what Hutchins looked at were cases where, in, a, in addition to conceptual blending, you had objects that served as an input. The structure of the object served as an input and could then itself come into the blended space and become a material way of remembering or manipulating the blended space. Now, I'm going to show you some of these objects that Hutchins talks about and you'll see that they're often, the ones I'm going to start with, often have to do with various kinds of technology. But then I intend to return to language and, and speech by showing that, in fact, we can look at writing and we can look at signing in sign language and we can look, in fact, ultimately at speaking phonetically as also having components of material anchorings. So we'll start with the more visible cases, the ones that Hutchins talks about. And I will start with the, the, measuring of, the measurement of time. In the previous lectures, we've talked about time a lot because we've talked about the complexities of time metaphors. 
And so this was mentioned in the previous lectures, that one compression that humans do, and this is now uh, not a material compression, it's a conceptual one, uh, humans see the day, day after day after day, and all these days are analogous. They're, they, ha they have the sun rising and the sun setting and the sun being high at noon. And they're also similar in the activities people do. They have regular activities like breakfast and lunch and dinner and so on and lectures and whatever. And the, the analogy of these days is compressed into a unique cyclic day so that we can talk about days not in terms of all the multiple days you know that people have ever experienced or will experience but in terms of a single day that is cyclic and starts over and over again we say the, the day runs its course we say that we go through the day and then the day starts again when we wake, wake up, okay? So we've compressed all these multiple days into a single day that goes around and around. And then uh, the, now the material anchoring comes in with the invention of various timekeeping devices. And I will just use the watch that we use today. I won't worry about the history, but they have a similar history. And with the watch that we have today, and if you think of a child learning to tell time and learning to understand the connection of the watch with conceptual time, what you need to do is you need to be able to put in correspondence the conceptual notion of a cyclic day and the mechanical object, the watch with hands that go around and around. And from that, from those two notions, you get a blended space in which you have time here on the clock or on the watch and in which you have emergent structure. You have new units of time here, like seconds, minutes, and so on, that you did not have in the original perception of time. The universe does not show you seconds, minutes, and so on. And of course, over here in this input, this is just a mechanical device. It doesn't, in itself, it doesn't have time in it. The reason we end up with a timepiece here, with watches or clocks that tell time, is because the engineering of the device is such that all the different watches and clocks are synchronized. This is an engineering possibility. And so it allows a compression of the multiple timepieces that we have, maybe we all have, or many of us have watches on our wrist or, uh, or on our cell phone or whatever, and they are compressed into a single one, the idea of a universal time that we all share. Now, this turns out to have very important implications for metaphor that I talked about on Saturday, I think. We won't return to them here. Here we look at the material anchor aspect, namely that the culture within cultural time successively ev evolves these material objects, in this case the watches, in such a way that people can use the watch in order to trigger the blend. That is, if you know what a watch is, you don't just know that it has hands, that rods that turn around and around. The child who first experiences the watch experiences the watch as a toy that you can play with. But when you learn the conceptual system, you learn to map, of course, the watch and the clock to your daily activities, to the days, to the, to, to the weeks perhaps, and you end up with the richer conception of the timepiece. So the watch has now become a material anchor for the conceptual notion of time. Things like seconds and minutes and so on cannot exist without the engineering spectacular feat of building completely synchronized objects that have motion. Okay? So it's the motion of these objects that, is, that we interpret as time. Okay, So that's an example of a material anchor. A material object that serves 
to help us in one input, our conception of the material object, help us to build a complex blended space, in this case, the notion of timepiece and measurement of time with seconds, minutes, and so on. Okay, let's look at a second example. And uh, <clears throat> I think I've got, okay, so this example has, this example is a dial from airplanes. Not the most modern airplanes, but, you know, slightly older ones. They had this dial for the pilot on the cockpit. And the, the, um, the dial has these clips on it, which actually have different colors. I should get a, a colored slide here. So they're like a green, blue, yellow, you know, orange maybe. I don't know the exact colors. And the clips can be moved. These are clips that you can move on the dial. And the dial itself is showing you the uh, speed of the airplane. And let me see if I have... Oh, I thought I had the description of this. Okay. Yeah. Oh, I think I have it on your handout. Do you all have handouts? Look at the handout. And... Mm. Okay, if you look on page 2 of the handout, that's page 68 for those who have the big handout. If you look on page 2, you will see this dial, and next to it, actually, you'll see the corresponding display for modern airplanes. Okay, so... And if you read the, um, the description here on the handout, you'll see that the dial is giving the pilot information on when to reconfigure the wings. The wings have flaps, and the flaps can be in these four different positions. And the four different positions depend on the speed, but they also depend on the overall weight of the airplane. That is, how much fuel it's got in it, and how much merchandise, it, how much cargo it's carrying, and how many people. Okay? So, in order to know when to change the flaps on the wings, you have to know the weight of the airplane at the time that the airplane is going to land, when the pilot is going to land the airplane. Therefore, you know, the pilot has traveled a certain distance, uh, a certain number of fuel has disappeared, the plane is lighter in terms of fuel, there was a certain cargo in the plane. So at each trip, depending on the cargo and depending on how far you travel, the positions of the, the, the speeds at which you must change the wing flaps, the speeds will be different. Okay? On the modern display, the one you see here, <coughs> uh, do I have it on the... Uh, no, I have it... Huh. I don't have it on my slide. Uh, you've got it on the You've got it on the handout again. So on the modern display that you see on the handout, you have to read the speed. It's in the left window somewhere, and it tells you 200. And then you have to ask yourself, if you're the pilot, <coughs> you have to say, given how much cargo I have and given how much fuel I've spent, you know, is this the right speed to change the flap on the, uh, on the wing? But what this system does is the following. The pilot, before leaving, before even flying up, the pilot knows how much fuel he's going to spend on the trip. And the pilot also knows how much weight he's carrying. So he looks up in the right tables, and he finds, for that weight and for the weight of fuel on arrival, he finds the right speeds to change the flaps. And then he puts, he moves the clips. He moves the clips to the corresponding speed. So he does that before taking off. Okay? And then, and that's the beauty of the thing, then he does not have to worry about, uh, you know, the speed because all the pilot has to do now is to always have the same behavior. He knows that when, when, when you reach, you know, here's the speed indicator, when the speed indicator gets to the orange clip, you change the flap. When it gets to this yellow clip, you change the flap again. You get to this clip, 
I called it the blue one maybe, change the flap, and the red one. This is in the blended space that has been created. In the blended space, all you need to know is the color of the clips. And the rest is irrelevant. So what has happened is this has served as a material anchor. It, is, it has been mapped, this simple you know, uh, dial with a hand and with the four colors, and you don't even have to look at these numbers anymore, it has been mapped onto the complex, diffuse situation of com computing the speeds, computing the weights, and so on. And in the blended space now, the pilot can just remember only one thing, the colors of the clips, and change the flaps at the same color. No matter what trip he's on, because of course, on different trips, these clips will be in different positions, but they'll all be in the same order with respect to each other, and so the pilot will always be doing the same thing. Well, this compression of behavior for the pilot is actually very similar to the compression that we saw for ch snatching the food from the starving child. That is, it has human scale now. You could teach a child now to do this. You tell the child, oh, change the speed when you see the, the red or the blue or the yellow or the orange. It becomes a simple human scale activity. It is made possible by the engineering, of course, of the material anchor. And then it's made possible by the action of the pilot when he, when he starts out with the plane and actually puts the clips in their right position. Here's another very interesting airplane example of the same kind. This is a modern <coughs> jet, and on the display in the airplane cockpit, there is an automatic computation of the future flight of the plane. The plane is headed in a certain direction and will land, you know, on some, uh, at some airport. Now, again, if you look at the, uh, at this explanation, the pilot has to know, in order to be able to land when he wants to, the pilot has to know what speed will correspond to a certain altitude. So during descent, the pilot will be told at a certain altitude, for example, 13,000 feet, the pilot will be told, uh, now you're cleared, you can land. He wants to achieve that altitude by the time that he reaches the location. So that will depend on what vertical speed the pilot is actually picking, and the pilot has a knob where he can control the vertical speed. You can see, we don't have to worry, you and I, most of us, I, I presume, are not pilots, so we don't have to worry about this complex uh, behavior where you have to make sure that you're going to be at 13,000 feet exactly at this point, and therefore you have to adapt your vertical speed so that you get that result. Okay? Complex computation that goes on inside the plane that goes on in the inside the pilot's head and on and on. Now, what happens is that there is this, uh, on the display, there is this blue arrow which the pilots call a, huck, a little hockey stick, you know, like in playing hockey. So this is a hockey stick and the hockey stick on the future flight will tell you if the hockey stick is here you will be told, uh, you know, the altitude of the corresponding point. And um, you will be told this is where you need to be at 13,000 feet in order to be able to land. So the pilot can see the hockey stick. But now, and here's where things get interesting, if the pilot modifies the vertical speed, if you change your vertical speed, then, for example, suppose you increase your vertical speed, so you, you go down a lot faster. Then you will reach 13,000 feet earlier, before 
this point. If you reduce your vertical speed, you're going to reach the point later, okay? Because either you go down very fast or very slowly, and so on your fu future flight, that will change how fast uh, you reach a certain point. Now what happens is that the pilot, by just turning the knob for vertical speed, will make this little blue hockey stick move. It'll move because, again, the vertical speed will change the place where the ideal altitude is, reach, is reached. Right? Given this system, everything is now compressed. <coughs> the pilot, instead of doing the long, the complex calculation and coordination, can just say, well, I know I need to achieve the altitude you know, in this city, so I just move my knob here, and the knob will make the hockey stick move, and I'll just m keep moving the, nod, the, the knob so that the hockey stick stays exactly in that position where I want it to be. So again, a tremendously complex engineering calculation and computation by the pilot has suddenly been compressed into something very direct and very simple, which is you turn the knob, and you look at the blue hockey stick and you want it to stay in that position. And again, now you can teach this to a child. Um, in the fourth lecture, where we studied emergent structure, we showed that similar things happen in mathematics. More complex stages of mathematics actually produce nicer, more uh, um, human scale compressions. So imaginary numbers become conceptualized as complex numbers in space, which is a very easy conception, it turns out, but very hard to discover for the ma mathematicians. In the same way here, this is a hard thing to achieve as an engineer. But, crucially, the pilots uh, mm, here, the compression was not taught to pilots because the, 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 the airplane instruments were not deliberately conceived in order to allow this compression. It's an accident of the system that you can actually manipulate the hockey stick. This is not something the engineers had uh, foreseen. And so the pilots discover this. They were not taught this. And so the pilots said, hey, look, I found a really great system you know, to, to do my landing. All I have to do is turn the knob and to wherever that knob will move the hockey stick to wh wherever it should be for the landing. And uh, when the hockey stick is in the right position, away you go, he said. Away you go and you land. So notice how different this is from digging the grave and uh, uh, snatching the food. It looks very different. but. In fact, in order to achieve this, it's like the watch and it's like the other purely mental compressions. These are cases where uh, the human species has culturally been able to build material objects. In this case, the uh, material display and the knob and, of course, the airplane that goes with it with all the hidden complexity. So just like we have hidden complexity in our minds, the, the airplane, of course, has hidden computations going on that will automatically calculate the position here as a function of the vertical speed over here. All this we don't need to see. We, all we need is this human, human scale operation in the blend where we turn the knob and the little blue hockey stick moves and we, the pilot achieves the right result. So this is quite spectacular. In, in cases like this, um, it's, of course, accessible to, to the human mind because you have double scope blending again, but this time the particular material anchors that you need, whether it's watches or uh, the dial with the, with the clips or the display here, all these material anchors have been produced this time by the culture over a number of generations, over a period of years with specialized engineers and on and on. Hutchins shows other cases where you have the material anchor. For example, your hand 
is a good material anchor. And there's a system apparently used by Japanese students a lot, maybe some of you know it, where you can immediately find, you, by looking at your fingers, you can immediately find uh, when, what day of the week some particular date is going to be. So you're told, you know, March 13th, uh, 2025, and you look at your hand and you say, that's a Wednesday. Does anybody know that system? Here? No. So I guess it's, this is in Japan. And this is because there is a clever correspondence that is set up between the different parts of your fingers and the different days of the week and a little human scale operation where you can just do something. Well, I don't know how to do it anymore. I learned, but I forgot. But it's very simple. And then you can find, you know, it's a Wednesday. So here's a case where the object that is used as a material anchor is not a complicated uh, feat of engineering. It's a co complicated feat of biology. It's the hand that you happen to have with you all the time to do other things, and suddenly it gets used as a material anchor. Okay. Mm. Okay. More, more of the same. Well, let's switch to money. The conception of money, again, seems very familiar to us. We just, uh, you know, we take uh, uh, yuans out of our pockets and <laughs> we give them to somebody and uh, they give us, uh, you know, whatever we want, bottles and uh, books and everything else. And we've done it for so long and as children we've learned to do it early. So it seems like the most simple and obvious kind of behavior. But if you think about it, it's actually a very strange behavior. Here's this piece of paper. In itself, the piece of paper, of course, has no value. I can burn it. I can do whatever I want with it. So it's only through a complex mental and social process that suddenly that piece of paper can do magic, like getting me uh, the water and uh, anything else. In order to, to do this, in order to achieve this, um, money as an abstract concept, which notice other species don't have. They have exchange between some things, but they don't have anything general like money that they can use for anything they want. And the way it works is something like this. You have two inputs to the kind of blend you need for money. And money, whether it's a, a, a paper bill or a coin, a material um, um, a piece of gold or metal or whatever, the money is going to be the material anchor for the blend. So let's see how that works. One input is the input of trading and bartering without money. So try and go back to times when there was no money and people had to just exchange things. So the fisherman would fish and he had 30 salmon and he could bring the 30 salmon and he could ask somebody who was weaving cloth, you know, he'd say, I'll give you 30 salmon and you give me your piece of cloth. And then the piece of cloth could be used to get maybe 10 chicken from the farmer. And the farmer could give to the, to the blacksmith, he could give two cows in order to get one plow. So obviously there's a rich system of exchange for humans that is easy for us to understand. It's called bartering. And so an economical system can function with this and without money, for example. But once we have, so suppose you have this input of plows and cows and salmons and, and cloth and everything, the goods. And you sort of know what something is worth, whether you can get some fish for your, for your chicken or some, uh, uh, some cloth for your uh, cow or whatever. You end up having a notion of what they're worth proportionately, of course. So you can build a conceptual scale this time that uh, the cow is uh, worth... Uh, for example, 60 salmon here. The cow is 120 units of something. The other one is two units. This is abstract. This is just to express the proportion of the two. Still no money. Still no material anchor. Now, magically, we take 
the whatever it is, in this case it's the, on my slide, it's the Cuban peso, uh, but it could be the, the American dollar or the Chinese yuan. And what we do is we put in one of the inputs, we suddenly put this piece of paper. Now the piece of paper at that point has zero value. As a piece of paper, you cannot eat it, you cannot, uh, you know, use it for clothes, you cannot do anything with it. So the piece of paper in itself has zero value on here. The trick is for society in this case, for the society, well, for one thing, to make the piece of paper in such a way that they're hard to imitate, right? Hard to make counterfeit pieces of paper. So to make them in a special way, and then from this input, where they're just pieces of paper, you bring them into the blend. Now, in the blend, you have the notion of value of things, which is projected by from the real world of things. A plow, that's worth a lot to me. Uh, salmon is worth a little bit, and so on. And then from here, you have the actual proportion of values for these objects. You bring in the dollar bill, and of course, the social community agrees on some value for this element on the scale. So over here, it's only paper, but over here, it's like the timepiece that we had before. In the input, you just have some mechanical device with the hands turning, but in the blended space, suddenly that mechanical device becomes time. And here, you just have paper, but when you project it into the overall blend, then suddenly everything has value. A cow has the value of, you know, whatever it is, 120 units here, and the dollar bill itself has value, in this case, of one unit. So, we end up in the blend, of course, with projection from here, exchange system, we can exchange things here, and in particular, we can exchange so many dollars for, you know, so many cows, that's easy. And from over here, we have the proportion, which is not the inherent value of the paper, the paper has none, but it's the emergent value in the blended space. So something as simple as a piece of uh, paper can suddenly become a material anchor for an elaborate blend. This is relevant to linguists for the reason that I announced at the beginning, because these operations are the same ones that we saw with metaphor, with grammatical constructions, and so on. So there are examples of this using material objects in addition to uh, our conceptual structures. But they're also interesting, I think, for linguists in, in another respect, related respect, they show the evolution of a concept. And here, uh, at this very simple stage, you have the concept of money in the simple sense of money that you can, you know, give to somebody else, put in your pocket, and so on. Why? Because it's a piece of paper. Of course, as further blends come along, the con concept of money will change because maybe you won't have to manipulate money at all, okay? It'll all be with a credit card or something, okay? So this is not a credit card, it's my hotel card, but imagine it's a credit card. Uh, then it's a different conception of money. This credit card does not, it's also a piece of paper almost, or plastic, but it doesn't map to a single value here. It suddenly, of course, has more complex interactions. And to relate it to this blend, you have to start doing other successive blends. We talk of money in all these cases, as if it's always money, but in fact, both the manipulation and the conception changes all the time because of uh, influence from the technology that we build, the banking system in this case, or, um, you know, things that we discover. So in mathematics, the concept of number, as we looked at a little bit in lecture four, the concept of number changes all the time. Now, for a, for a linguist, you say number, well, that's a word. You look in the dictionary, what does number mean? Well, one, two, three, and then you stop. But the reality, of course, is that you have over cultural time, over centuries, 
you have a change in the concept of number through successive blends. Each notion of number is blended later with others. Well, here it's the same thing. This very primitive notion of money that is the result of a blend can now be blended with other things, such as, for example, uh, banking, where you just write notes, where you, you, you sign your name on a check. So you blend this notion with the notion of check, where you decide what the piece of paper is worth, how it maps onto this. And then the notion of check itself, of course, can be uh, further blended in order to produce more abstract notions like the credit card. But in each case, the blended space that you end up with is a very simple one. Okay? Again, a child can learn to use money, give the, you know, give the uh, one yuan and get a bottle of water or something, and, but the child can also learn to use, unfortunately, can use, <laughs> learn to use the credit card, right? If you give a child the permission to use a credit card, then they understand. They give the storekeeper the credit card and they say, I want that toy and this toy and that toy, and it, it works fine. So these are very simple to use, even though, again, they're built in, 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 the, in the invisible mental and social world, they're actually built on very complex uh, connections. Well, here's another example of the material anchors and conceptual blends. And this one is taken from the domain of magic and religion. So it's the example of voodoo. And in the sort of simplest case of voodoo, you would have again, two different inputs. So this is the case where, you know, the, the sorcerer uh, who does the voodoo can kill somebody by making up, by making a little doll of the person, okay? And then performing the right ritual. And it, on that doll, ideally, you try and get hair from the person. You steal hair from the person you put on the doll. And maybe a piece of uh, of clothes from the person to make the doll's clothes. And then you stick a big pin like this, okay? You stick a big pin into the doll. That's what happens in this input. So in this input, you're just, you have a doll and you're sticking a pin into the doll and the doll, of course, is an inanimate object and nothing special happens to the doll. But that input is then connected to another conceptual input where the doll corresponds to the person the witch doctor wants to kill and parts of the doll, the hair of the doll corresponds to the hair of that person because it's a piece of the hair, it's a part whole uh, metonymy, it's a synecdoche um, or uh, the, the, um, the um, little you know, shirt of the doll corresponds is a piece of cloth from a, a shirt of the person. Again, you have a part whole metonymy that's operating here, a synecdoche that's giving you connection between the real person and the doll. And so, of course, the action over here corresponds to something happening over here. The real person dies as a result of having the voodoo performed. In this, in this input, there is nobody actually stabbing the person. The person is not being attacked or anything like that. So, in fact, what is going on is that this voodoo ritual with the result of the person dying cause and effect relation. You do this and later the person dies. And this is the, the compressed into a blend where the doll is the person, so it's compressed in the person. And when you do, when the, the sorcerer does the action of stabbing the pin, the pin is a lethal dagger and it kills the person because you're sticking the da dagger in the person. And therefore, in the blended space, the person dies. Now, you might say, well, so what? I mean, isn't this just crazy? I mean, it's made up by the witch doctor and who cares? In fact, a number of people do die as a result of this kind of voodoo practice. And one of the reasons is belief in something. If you believe in the conceptual blend, 
If the whole society around you believes in it, then people see the, the voodoo ritual with the stabbing of the doll, they see that as you have been killed, you no longer exist. And you're told that and you also believe in it, therefore, you know, you believe you don't exist anymore. And nobody pays any attention to you anymore because you're dead. And you yourself, you know that you're dead, so you don't eat, you don't, you know, your life has lost any, any meaning, and in fact, you die. So you die through a complex causal connection, which is not directly the, the hat pin in the doll. But the reason you die is because you and others in the social group happen to share this blended space in a very strong way so that whatever happens in that space actually happens. And this is true of many religious rituals. If you are a uh, Catholic who uh, takes communion and believes in the Eucharist, then the material anchors in that case are the host. You know, you take communion and you swallow the host and the priest has the wine also to give you communion and the wine is the blood of Christ and the host is the body. And if you believe that, then you have a strong blend which is shared by the members of your community. In one of the inputs, you have, of course, uh, Christ and, uh, uh, you know, the, the invisible aspects of the religion. In the other input, you have very practical things. You have the little wafer, the host that you're going to eat, and you have the wine, which is ordinary wine. But in the blended space, that wine is the blood of Christ and the wafer is the body and you have the belief and therefore many feelings, many emotions and so on will follow. So the power of belief independently of you know, whether that belief is right or wrong is sort of irrelevant here. Uh, if you believe you are able, whether it's the voodoo example or the Catholic communion example or any others in religion, you are able to create blended spaces which become the new reality and which people around you share and therefore will trigger your uh, emotions and responses and so forth. Now, the, key, the crucial thing for us as linguists, of course, is that again, the compression that we find here is the standard in, uh, compression that we find in very ordinary linguistic examples. So, examples that I... Uh, showed you or that I evoked in previous lectures like my tax bill, the tax bill, my tax bill gets longer all the time, is a compression of different tax bills. You get one, a different one every year and you compress them into a single one. So the analogy of the tax bills becomes compressed into uh, the uniqueness of a single tax bill. And the disanalogy of the tax bill, the fact that they're different, some are longer than others, becomes compressed in the blended space into change. Language, in other words, systematically has built-in compressions and blends of this kind in its very most elementary structures. Whether you say the tax bill gets longer, whether you say guilty pleasures or dolphin safe, or you know, uh, more elaborate syntax like uh, they prayed the boys home caused motion but with verbs that in themselves ha are not caused motion at all. That's why the two have to be brought together and looked at because they, as, as it turns out, they require the same kind of compression. And they lead, just as in the language examples, remember we have these counterfactuals uh, like the, uh, with the grandparents and the grandson that murdered the grandparents and we had the example where um, in the blended space the father said if the grandparents were alive they would plead for mercy for the grandson and that was illogical because they couldn't both be alive and be murdered. Well, uh, here again this looks illogical also like the voodoo or the Catholic Eucharist right, they look irrational because you say, how can you kill somebody by, uh, you know, putting a pin in a doll? Or how can you get the uh, religious experience of Christ 
by eating a little piece of wafer. Okay? From the outside, those look, those look illogical. But when they have been compressed into a blended space, they become the reality of our cultural experience. So we would not question our beliefs here any more than we question our language. People don't keep asking all the time, why, does, why do you say my tax bill gets longer? You can see that my tax bill is not changing size. It's always the same size. And now I have another tax bill from last year. It's a different one. No, people accept the compression as automatic, whether it's grammatical uh, constructions or whether it's, in this case, uh, religious experiences or uh, the uh, examples before the pilot in the cockpit. Why do I uh, bother to, you know, bring together all these examples? Well, again, to make as strong a case as I can for the notion that these very singular human activities, technology leading to planes, science leading to mathematics, uh, religion leading to voodoo or the Eucharist, and of course, language leading to grammatical compressions like my tax bill is longer and longer, that they are all using as a sort of fundamental uh, cognitive framework and operation, they are all using this same type of double scope compression. Without the double scope compression, you cannot do any of these. They would not make sense. Now, here's an example that we see. Let's see, I start, I have to think of uh, stopping pretty soon and then we'll have questions. So let me just, let me just evoke a couple more things, sort of returning to language now. Now, in sign language, and uh, sign language, as you know, is, uh, the, this is the language, language is often used by uh, the deaf, but that can be learned by anybody, especially if you're a child. And the sign languages have elaborate grammar, elaborate phonology, just as complex as the spoken languages. But in some cases, because of the um, spatial modality of sign language, you see the material anchors a lot better, a lot more directly. So here's a real, you know, here's a, 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 a genuine piece of data. This is a man who is reporting a conversation who is, who is talking about a cartoon with uh, the cat Garfield. I don't know if this is a known cartoon in China, but this is a cat, and this is the owner of the cat. And so this is the original cartoon. And this man, speaking in sign language, is describing something that's happening, and this, the sign that he has is some words in the sign language, and I forget actually what he was saying. I, it doesn't matter. But that's what we actually see. So we see this. And he is looking towards, he is looking in that direction, and he is making a certain sign. Maybe he's making the sign for, um, I have to check that, whether he's making the sign for cat at that point or for something else that's happening. But the important thing is that he is using his own body and his own position in space as a material anchor in order to map onto this cartoon that he's describing. So that you see that here, he is the cat. He is mapped onto the cat, and he's taking the same stance as the cat, looking at the owner. Now, there is no owner over here, but by means of words in sign language, he is also evoking the owner. And in fact, he can shift perspectives and take the perspective of the owner. So here's the material anchor in this case. It's the body of the person with the, the right orientations. And in the blended space, what we build when we interpret what's going on here, we project this person as a counterpart of Garfield the cat. So we understand this is Garfield. And we project the owner over here of Garfield into the blended conception of the cartoon, even though over here it's only indicated by uh, words. Okay? And so we build this. So the material anchor is crucial in building our conception of what the person is trying to say. The person is using his, again, his body both to produce words, just like we produce words also with our mouth, 
but he's also using his body, and we do that all the time. I've been gesturing in front of you and moving my hands and moving my arms because we have a system of gesture that also has a very strong uh, metaphorical and um, um, material anchored component, okay? And the gestures are a useful part of communicating. Now, when we see that this is happening in sign language, and by the way, let me give another example. Uh, linguists all love anaphora, pronouns, and so on. One way of setting up pronouns in sign languages is to set up imaginary positions in space. Okay, so that this person is here, this person is here, and now I can refer, I can remember these positions, and I can refer back to the person. In spoken speech, I cannot do that because I have a linear stream, and I have to use he and him and so on, and I have to build, in, in spoken language, I have to build the mental spaces in my head with the connections between the various participants. In the signed language, I can help myself a little with the modality by having some material anchors for the actual reference that I'm pointing to. So it gives what looks like a very superficially different pronominal system, but in fact, the reason it's different is only because the modality is superficially different, but what the spoken language person is constructing are these mental spaces where you do have positions of reference and connected reference, and in the, in the sign modality, you indicate the connection explicitly by actually moving your hand, and you indicate the referent by pointing to where the referent is. Now, if the referent is a person in the room or myself, I can use myself, of course, or the person in the room as a material anchor, as a referent, just as we do, in fact, in spoken language. When we gesture, we use the people in the room and we point to them. And in fact, we can even point to absent people. If you know that your friend, uh, you know, uh, Li Ping, I'm looking for Li Ping, he was sitting over there, he's not there anymore. So I can point to, to over there and say, uh, ah, he's over here now. But I can say, where is Li Ping? Uh, he's gone. Oh, now, now, I can, now I retrieve him, he's over here. Uh, so there are all kinds of ways in which we can use the, the anchoring around us, the real world around us, can become material anchors for gesture and speech. This is especially apparent in the case of of signed language where it becomes part of the grammar. So there's an excellent book that I recommend very strongly by Scott Liddell. It came out two or three years ago. It's on, that, it's on the website I told you about. And it details the mental space building and the blending that goes on in the grammar of sign language. It's grammar in sign language because now the conventions are uh, very rigid. So we're almost at the end. Um, I was going to tell you about uh, another kind of work on um, uh, blending in technology, and that's the invention of the ATM. And this is pretty straightforward. You know the ATM machine where you get, you get money from the machine? And it's very straightforward that it's a blend of, on the one hand, the banking system, and on the other hand, something like computing. So you get a blend that's the ATM with the material anchor, of course, of the, the actual machine that you go to. Uh, it's non-trivial to analyze this blend, and um, it's not as simple as it looks to find all the right counterparts. And so on your handout, you can look at this work by Barbara Holder, who did a very detailed, very interesting article on, um, on uh, creating new creating ATMs, credit cards, checkbooks, and extensions through check, card, check cards. So this is again a case of conceptual change where the notion of credit card will change, the notion of money will change, and uh, we could go on and on if I, had, if I had more time. This is an example I will show you very quickly of how um, material objects that we, that we handle all the time, they can be used as material anchors for expressing something. So this is my, my bill that I see. This is my name here, and it's the bill I get in the mail 
to pay my electricity in California. Okay. Now, if I turn the if I turn over the envelope, and I hope <laughs> I hope the computer. There we go. It turns over the envelope, and you see up there. You see, make this envelope disappear. Make this envelope disappear. Go paperless. Now, you see what they're trying to say. They're saying, you don't have to pay your bills with paper bills. You can go online and have just a regular payment of bills without, without envelopes coming to your house every, every, uh, every month. But the literal meaning here is make the envelope disappear. That would be a magician saying, hey, here's the envelope. Poof, no envelope. How can that mean go online. How, that envelope will always be there. The envelope that you got in the mail, no matter whether you go online or not, it will always exist. Okay? It won't disappear because you start to have uh, a computer account for the electric bill. So what's actually happening here is, again, a very, very elaborate, it's like the, the dinosaurs and the, and the, the uh, tax bills that we talked about, but even more elaborate. We imagine strings of envelopes. If I don't do anything, envelopes keep coming in the future. If I do something, envelopes stop coming. Now I compress all the envelope into a single one, like the cyclic day. So this is the envelope that comes. I can say this is the bill or the envelope that comes every month in my mail. The envelope. Notice how language compresses. There's now a single env envelope, even though in fact you receive hundreds of envelopes. It becomes the envelope. Now you take the particular envelope that's in your hand and you compress further so that all these imaginary envelopes that you would be receiving, suddenly they are this envelope, which is the envelopes you already received, and then now the ones you will not receive are compressed into nothing. You have nothing. So before you had one envelope that is the compression of all the ones you received before, analogy compressed into identity, into uniqueness, and on the other side, you have all the envelopes, imaginary envelopes, that you will receive in the future if you don't do anything. You compress them and you get nothing because you have switched to online, so no envelopes come. So you go from having the one envelope and having nothing. Now, that's a very, very fancy uh, uh, human meaning construction. And linguistically, it means that you have to use the word disappear, but you have to go from the literal meaning in a blended space and you have to decompress your blended space into this long sequence of scenarios with many, many envelopes and a counterfactual and so on. It's a very complex, uh, you know, uh, logical operation to do all this. Okay. And there are many other compressions in that example. And we could go on and on. I could tell you about how mirrors are compressions and how they then get used in, for example, uh, literature. And you think of the use of mirror, let's say, in literature, in Shakespeare or, or whatever, uh, or in language as the mirror of the mind. You think of that as uh, original. And a mirror itself is simple, but a mirror turns out to understand a mirror, to be able to talk to your mirror, to be able to use the mirror to... Uh, see other people and imagine other worlds, you actually have to build very complex blends. So the very simple things like mirrors turn out, material objects again, turn out to trigger vast expanses of conceptual uh, decompression. And I think that's, that's enough. I hope the, this unusual point that I've been trying to make, that things like airplane cockpits, watches, the hand when it's used to figure out the date, or uh, the um, uh, voodoo dolls where you put a pin, or the envelope, that they are all part of these same cognitive operations that we find for grammar and language in general. Thank you.